First of all, I want to say it's a great honor to be here. Um, but before I go any further, I definitely want to thank President Wilcox. What a wonderful man, being able to listen to him and to feel of his spirit. Uh, I think it's also a great honor for us, obviously, to have a congressman here, Congressman Gulab. I'm grateful for you. We know you're a busy man, um, so we're grateful that you're able to be here. I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I'm also not an idiot. So um, I made a lot of bad decisions growing up, but one decision I made right is I married the right person. And so um, before I do that, before I say anything, I'm going to turn the time over to my boss. Um, I'll just share a quick story before I turn it over to my wife. But um, you know, last we've been married. I better get these years right. She's, she's looking at me. <laughs> I'll just say close to 30 years. We've been married for a long time. And because uh, I always get that right, I always get my kids' birthdays wrong. Because, honey, it's not July, it's August 29th. I'm sorry. But, um, but last week, my wife got sick and she wasn't able to go to church. And all the years that we've been married, my wife, I can maybe think of three times that she's missed church. And so she couldn't go and she was sick. And it made me realize that I don't know anything and how insignificant I am in my own home. I don't know where anything's at or any of the Tupperware. And my son, who's a senior in high school, we were just looking at each other. We couldn't do anything. You know, who's making breakfast? You, you, no, you do it. And, and where are the eggs? And, you know, where do we get all these things? And um, I'm just so grateful for her. I'm grateful she's my eternal companion. Uh, she's been the rock of our family. And without her, I, there's no doubt in my mind our family would not be where they're at right now. Uh, we have three wonderful children, as Joe was talking about. My oldest daughter is a flight attendant in Hawaii. Um, she was, lived a little bit here on the East Coast. Actually, most of her life was here on the East Coast, but she's an island girl. She, she doesn't want to come back to the East Coast. I've been trying to bribe her to come back, and she's like, no, Dad, I'm staying in Hawaii. Um, my other son, Va'a, is um, going to be a junior, plays football at BYU, and my youngest will be going on his mission soon. And of all the things, um, I'm grateful to coach football and I'm grateful for the young people that I've been having a chance to influence. But I'm most proud of our family and the person who does all the work. Like I said, I think the only thing I know at the house is where the remote's at. Other than that, I don't, I don't know anything else. Uh, but I'm going to turn the time over to my wife, Barbara. Thank you. And before I begin, I just want to say aloha. Aloha. It's been such a great experience. We drove in late last night, um, a little late because our son actually just flew in the other day from um, Provo. So we were rushing around getting some things done, so we weren't able to get here as early as we wanted to yesterday. But just as we, we kind of took a wrong turn as well, you know. GPS isn't always the smartest thing. Um, <clears throat> but we did finally get here, I'd say about roughly about 10.35, pulled in in front of the night um, guest home. What an what a awesome experience. We were so excited. Great hospitality. We felt it from the moment we got here on your campus. So thank you so much. Thank you for this great opportunity to be here with you. I've never been here before. But is Karan Giroux here? Kiwi, are you here? There you are, I've been looking for you. Kiran is one of my seminary students, so. <laughs> so now I can tell his mom that I saw him. So I have to see you after and make sure you're doing okay. <clears throat> so we have just been, we've known that Kiwis loved it here. Um, we hadn't been here yet. We're so great when we came, we've come. And I told President Wilcox, I'm trying to think, how are we going to get back here again? How do we get reinvited back here? So you have a really, really special place here. And we felt that when we got here. And that is such an exciting thing. Just as we even sang the Battle Hymn of the Republic, I almost started to cry, thinking his truth is marching on, thinking here you are learning phenomenal truths, great truths you need to know, truths um, in, your, in your academic endeavors, but also other wonderful phenomenal truths about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how to become um, great people and great ambassadors for Jesus Christ. These are the great things that you're learning here. It's a great time in your life. Um, 
I, I work a lot with the youth, so you're a little older than the youth. You're the, the young adults. Um, but it's a great time to be alive in, in the world today. There are so many phenomenal things going on that are great and good. We know there are some, there's a lot of bad things, but there's really great and good things, and we get to be a part of all that, and I'm so grateful for this time. I want to share a quote with you. In our family, we have a, um, a daily quote that gets sent out to our family group text. And so this year, it's my turn to do all the quotes. So every day, we have to send something. And so I had sent this about a week ago. This was um, from President Hinckley, and I'm trying to do this without my glasses. And he says, keep faith with the best that is in you. Your own constant self-improvement will become as a polar star to those with whom you associate. They will remember longer what they saw in you than what they heard from you. Your attitude, your point of view can make such a tremendous difference. And I've thought a lot about that, that just as we serve in our small little roles, you know, I, I know Kiwi, you'd be surprised. I only have 11 students this year. I think when Kiwi was with me, I had 25 registered students in class. But in my small little basement, in my small little role, I know that I'm doing something to help build the Lord's kingdom and to make an improvement not only in the lives of the kids that are registered that come and study with me every morning, but mostly in my life, to be honest with you. Seminary has been a phenomenal blessing for me. I've learned in my life that as I serve and as I give to others, I'm actually the greatest recipient of everything because I was doing that. And I think that's the message I want to leave with you today is we live in a great time. And this is a great time for you as you prepare and learn to do those things. But as you leave from here and as you maybe go home on break, um, there's that opportunity to serve. And that's how you're really going to become the best you is as you implement what you're learning here and then you go out and you serve others. And that's when you'll really, really feel the greatest joy. Thank you so much for having me here today. I want you to know that I have a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is um, the foundation of my life. I love my family. Um, I love my Savior. Uh, there's nowhere I wouldn't go for him or anywhere. Obviously, I left Hawaii to go to the East Coast, um, which has become home. And I love it. And I love it not because of the place, but because of the people. And I'm so grateful to be here with you and fill of your spirits as well. And I share that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I'm so, too stubborn to wear my glasses. As I get older, I still want to say that I'm younger, but I, I can't see anymore, and I, like, I love to play basketball, and <laughs> I did a banquet once, and I wrote all these notes, and I couldn't say anything, and I, I, I couldn't see any notes. I mean, it looked like a different language to me, and my wife gave me glasses like that. She gave me her pink glasses, and I wore them the whole time, but, <laughs> but I, too, just want to reiterate what my wife said. You know, just as we came here, there is a special spirit here. Uh, as we pulled up, I, I think we went around the night guest house like three times. You know, is that the house? Is that the house? But saw some of the students, some of you uh, up by the corner, and just saw you guys laughing and giggling and just could see that you guys love being here. And I thought that was so cool. And so as I listened to everybody, as I, you know, we had an opportunity to come this morning and listen to Coach Tupé and his staff. Coach Mike gave a, um, call it Kool-Aid, but basically a, a spiritual thought. And the spirit was so strong there. Had an opportunity to meet with all those involved uh, with athletics from, you know, our athletic director, uh, Coach Lamb, I think is a wonderful man, and all the coaches, uh, obviously, and President Wilcox. There is a special spirit here. And the thing more than anything is I sat there and listened to all of the different coaches talk about where, they're, where they came from and their story. I thought about you. I thought about 800 of you from all the different places that you've come, and all of you could tell your story of how you got in here and how the Lord has guided you. There's no doubt in my mind that you are supposed to be here, that the Lord guided you here. I have a, I know exactly how he got here, um, and I know it was not by coincidence that the Lord had guided Joe as he got here. And so this is a very special place, and I know the spirit is so strong here. Uh, it's a beautiful area. 
It's a beautiful campus, but more than anything, I can feel of your beautiful spirit. And uh, my wife and I have just been, we can't get over that, just how there's such a wonderful, wonderful spirit here. I've been praying a lot about what to say. And Joe has kind of explained to me before, okay, this is a forum. It's not necessarily like a sacrament meeting or a fireside, and there's clapping and stuff, which I'm totally fine with, because I think in the gospel, the gospel is every part of your life. It's not just on Sundays. It's not just uh, certain times. It's, it's the way you live. And so I was totally fine with that. I think you can talk about spiritual things. Uh, I know we hold our Heavenly Father in great reverence and respect and I love him and adore him. But I believe he has a great sense of humor, too. And so as I came and thought, of, I think this would be a great format to speak. But before I do that, there are a couple of things I want to make sure as we come, because I know I just got the meeting with some of my players, and some of them are down, some of them are doing well, some of them are struggling in class, some have personal issues, whether with themselves or with their families. And this is the thing that I thought about you, just all 800 of you here. It doesn't make any of us better than anybody if they don't have the gospel. All of us are Heavenly Father's children. Those of us who have the gospel, we've just been blessed to have that. And it's our job to share it with others. It doesn't make us better than those who don't have the gospel. But here are some great truths that we have that I think we should never, never, never forget. Number one, our Heavenly Father loves us. First and foremost, what a wonderful knowledge to know that our Heavenly Father loves us. An all-powerful, an all-knowing being loves us tremendously. And as I try to think about it in some small little way, I think about a parent and how much I love my kids. You would do anything for your kids. Um, well, maybe, as I said, I was thinking about experience at our kitchen table. My son sometimes, he has some of the, I don't know, he has some of the craziest things, but he goes, Dad, if I was swimming and there's a great white shark, because I grew up, I'm from Laia in the North Shore, and it's, the, to me, the beautiful, most beautiful beaches in the world. But my family knows I have a phobia of sharks, so I always stay close to the shore and stuff. I'm, I mean, you have this beautiful beach, but I don't want to go out too far. And I have a phobia of sharks. And my son asked me, Dad, if a great white shark was, you know, in the water, would you come and save me? And I kind of paused a little bit before I could say anything. <laughs> my wife was cooking. She said, honey, I would jump in there in a second. And I just kind of put my head down. He was like, <laughs> um... You know, obviously, the, the love of a mother is way stronger than the love of a father. <laughs> but I know that I love my kids. And I would, I think I would, after my wife jumped in, I would jump in after. I mean, just, <laughs> but I would do anything for my kids. But that's first and foremost. All of us in this room have that great knowledge. And most people don't even know that, that our Heavenly Father loves us. Number two, because of that great love, our Heavenly Father sent His only begotten Son to perform the atonement. And the great thing about the atonement, it happened. It happened. The greatest event that has ever happened in the history of mankind, it happened. And we all know that it happened. Um, I thought President, um, excuse me, Elder Holland shared a great story about the gospel. And I, I kind of comes back to football related. But he shared this example. I think he, I can't really remember the exact details, but I don't know if they were traveling at the airport or something. And there was a score. Obviously, he was the president of BYU, so he's a huge BYU fan. Um, but I guess it was either delayed or something. And then he watched the game, but he already knew the score of the game. So I guess early part of the game, there was an interception. BYU threw an interception. But it didn't really bother him. He said, nah, we're still going to win. Who cares? You know, we had the interception. You know, and so if he didn't know that, you'd be nervous that there was a turnover and that things looked bleak. But he kind of related to that in, in our lives, that the atonement happened. And because of that, if we are on the Lord's side, we're going to win. The outcome of that game is already determined. We are going to win if we are on the Lord's side. Yes, there's going to be adversity. Obviously, all of us make mistakes, and the atonement helps with all of that. But because of the atonement and because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, if we are on the Lord's side, we're going to win. That game has already been decided. I think the thing that's most relevant for us here today is we live in the greatest time in the history of mankind. Um, we were watching a, uh, some war movie. I'm trying to remember what it was. I don't know if it was King Arthur or one of those repeats on you know, TNT one time. 
uh, we were watching the movie, and my son's like, man, I'm glad I didn't have to live in those times and some of those things. And, but we know we live in the greatest time when not only do we have technology and all the um, advances of technology, but the fullness of the gospel has been restored. All of our Heavenly Father's blessings are available to us. And that wasn't always the case. There have been many decades and many eras and many centuries during the history of mankind where our Heavenly Father's blessings weren't always available for people. We have them all. We live in the greatest time in the history of the world. And you are the greatest that our Heavenly Father has. You are the best. Um, Coach T and I, Fono T, from, uh, Tony and I and, uh, also met a young lady, I think, back there from Eva Beach. But um, the one great thing living in Hawaii, there are many great things, how beautiful it is, but they have the Pro Bowl every year. And it was always a great treat for fans in Hawaii because the best players would always come back uh, to Hawaii to play in that game. And it was kind of cool to see the best NFL players come back in one assembly to, be, to see all the greatest people, uh, athletes, being assembled there. And it was always cool for me to see that. But I just want to tell you, you are the all pros of our Heavenly Father. You've been saved. Nothing, none of this was by chance. You've been saved to come back in this generation when the fullness of the gospel has been restored. And this is something that just really, really hits and resonates with me. I got so many faults, so many weaknesses, and I know I need to do better. But we are preparing the way for the second coming of the Savior. Just let that set, set in a little bit. Yes, you guys are at school. Yes, I'm working or different people working. We're trying to do the best for our families as we work for our own salvation and exaltation. But ultimately, we are preparing the way for the second coming of the Savior. I mean, how cool is that? And so what a great responsibility we have. But you know what? Our Heavenly Father knows everything. And he brought you here at earth, on earth at this time to do that. The last one I'm going to talk about just as we get going to this, you guys are, again, at a special place. And I just want, again, just to make sure you guys res that resonates with you. I've been to a lot of different campuses, a lot of different places. As soon as I got here, I recognized that the Lord has blessed this place. And, yes, it's a beautiful building, but the people here, you, the faculty, the president, all the, the teachers and professors, everybody here has been guided to come here at this time. And this is a very, very special place. As you notice, I don't have any uh, fancy PowerPoints. I, I spoke at the LDS Business College once, and you know we had to do all this PowerPoint stuff. And I got there, and the speaker before me had one of those mics, like shows you how old I am. All I could think of, you know, I guess Janet Jackson or something. We're doing, the, <laughs> you know, going around the stage, and I'm like, is that what I have to do? But um, you know, it was a totally different environment, so I didn't know. If, this was going to be like that, that I had to dance around the stage or anything like that, but I can't dance. Um, at least my kids tell me that, because, Dad, please don't do that. You know, when we, when we go to this wedding, please don't dance that way. It's, it's embarrassing. But I don't have any fancy PowerPoints or anything like that. Um, I wanted to come here and speak by the truth and just to speak by the Spirit and pray that the Holy Ghost will bear, bear testimony of the things that I'm talking about are true. And sometimes I think it's good for us, um, not that I don't mind people having their, you know, their phones and stuff like that, because there's, there's so many great blessings that can help you from looking at it and learning and doing things, but um, I'm not here to entertain. I'm just here, I think, to share a message that I feel very strongly to share. And this is the message that I've been feeling about, and hopefully I can build up to what I'm trying to talk about. And first of all, I'll talk about, and hopefully this all relates, because everything comes back to the atonement of Jesus Christ. And I just thought about this. Uh, the atonement of Jesus Christ, obviously the, the most important thing that has ever happened in the history of mankind. There's nothing else that will ever happen that will be in a, as important as the atonement of Jesus Christ. And how do we remember that? Through the sacrament. The one ordinance that we do every week is the sacrament. And I've been, you know, really in my own personal time, been really just studying about the prayer and how beautiful and how simple the prayer is. And all those that have blessed the sacrament recognize how special that uh, opportunity is, but all of us who partake of the sacrament. But as we take of the sacrament, obviously, first and foremost, to remember his body and his blood and witness unto God, his Father, for these things, and we all know these, these are just things that we all know. 
take upon us his name, take upon us Jesus' name, always remember him, and keep his commandments which he has given him. So these are three things that uh, Jesus Christ has given to us, and we're witnessing to his father. And I thought, okay, here's the most important event that has ever occurred, and how has he told us to remember it? Through the sacrament. And so through this sacrament prayer, he's telling us, here are the most important things that you need to do. And I've and I thought about, okay, so here are the things that he wants us to do. And I know our Heavenly Father loves us more than we can ever imagine. And what is he going to do for us so that we may always have his spirit to be with us? That's it. And when I was younger, I used to think and, and read about In fact, I was reading on my mission once, and it probably a, wasn't a very good uh, personal study. But I, I, when I was reading about it, man, that's not fair. We have to do all these things, and we only get one thing. But, you know, I was just young and naive and, ig and ignorant. But it made me realize our Heavenly Father is giving us the greatest thing that we could have here. He's going to guide us. The greatest thing, if we do this, our Heavenly Father is going to give us the greatest thing that we need is guidance. To give us the Holy Ghost. And I've been thinking so much about this. Why is that so important? Why is it so important for us to do that? Why is that so essential? Then I thought about Moroni 10.5. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the, the truth of all things. Not just spiritual things, not just about essential stuff for our salvation. You may know the power and the truth of all things. And then it made me think a little bit about Lehi, when Lehi and his family. He got specific instructions of what to do with his family. You know, where they were supposed to go and do different things. And then I thought about uh, Nephi. Here is Nephi when he was commanded to build a ship. And I thought a little bit. Not that I'm Nephi or anything, but I thought about, I can't build anything. You know, I mean, I remember going to an Eagle Project and our state president's wife, I mean, she was nailing, you know, all these things, got nails in her mouth, and I, I think both of my thumbs were bleeding, you know what I mean? Just, uh, <laughs> I, I couldn't build anything. And here's Nephi, they actually lived in a desert, you know, in a, in, a, in a kind of a terrain where they weren't by the water, and when they got there, he was commanded to build a ship. How was he going to know how to build a ship? And I'm just wondering if you guys got your, got your um, scriptures or your phones, you can just turn. It's uh, 1 Nephi 18. Uh, I'm going to read 1 through 3. And I thought this was, again, I think this is so powerful. And it came to pass that they did worship the Lord and did go forth with me. And we did works, uh, work timbers of curious workmanship. And the Lord did show me from time to time after what manner I should work the timber of the ship. Now I, Nephi, did not work the timbers after the manner which was learned by men. Neither did I build the ship after the manner of men. But I build, did build, uh, it, build it after the manner. Maybe I should use these. Oh, there you go. It's not clear enough. Which the Lord had shown unto me. Wherefore, it was not after the manner of men. And I, Nephi, did go un, in unto the mount off. And I did pray un, oft unto the Lord. Wherefore, the Lord showed unto me great things. The Lord gave him specific instructions how to do this. This wasn't anything vague. It was very clear, and he told him exactly how to do that. Our Heavenly Father loves us. He wants to help us. He wants to show us. He wants to guide us. He wants to do all that he can to help us, and he's going to give us clear, specific instructions. You need to go to Southern Virginia. That's the place for you, or whatever you have. And you guys are at the most critical time in your lives most critical times where you're deciding what to major in, what am I going to do after school, who am I dating, is that the right person for me, should I marry them? I mean, there's so many critical decisions right now that you guys are making that are going to affect the rest of your life. You need the guidance of the Holy Ghost to help you. But I thought about this too. How do we know that voice? How do we know and recognize uh, the voice of the Holy Ghost? And if you guys can, go ahead and turn to DNC 8, 2 to 3. And I know these are all very familiar scriptures. Yea, behold, I will tell you in your mind and in your heart by the Holy Ghost which shall come upon you and which shall dwell in your heart. Now behold, this is the spirit of revelation. It has nothing to do with your ears. The Holy Ghost will speak to our mind and to our heart and will tell us. There will be promptings. There will be feelings of what we're supposed to do. And again, at such a critical time in your lives, when you're making very critical decisions, 
in high school, you know, you're making some decisions. They're important, you know, what am I going to wear to school today? And, you know, and just, well, so, does so-and-so still like me? Should I join the band or join the debate team? You know, I mean, there are things. But now you're making decisions that are going to affect the rest of your lives. And so it's important that you guys um, and all of us recognize how to uh, tell the spirit of revelation. And I'm going to close by this quote, and then I'm going to share some uh, personal experiences. But this is by President Boyd K. Packer. And I th to me, it's one of the most powerful, clearest descriptions of how to listen to the Holy Ghost. And this is what he said. That qu sweet, quiet voice of inspiration comes more as a feeling than it does as sound. Pure intelligence can be spoken into the mind. The Holy Ghost communicates with our spirits through the mind more than through the physical senses. The guidance comes as thoughts, as feelings, through promptings and impressions. We may feel the words of spiritual communication more than we hear and see them with spiritual, spiritual rather than mortal eyes. Brothers and sisters, that's the key for all of us. I'm going to be 51 years old next month, and um, I'm still learning how to do that. But that's how I guide my family. That's how I guide my life. And there's some experiences that I want to share as I finish up some personal experiences that I want to share about the promptings of the Holy Ghost. And I share this with you not to boast. Uh, these are personal and sacred experiences. And the only reason I share them with you is just hopefully maybe to help you uh, recognize in your own selves. You know, sometimes we're told not to share these, and it's just how you feel prompted. And I feel prompted these are experiences that I can share maybe to help bless others. The first one is... Um, it might sound simple, but I know if I didn't listen to this, I wouldn't be here. And again, uh, uh, Coach T recognized this, so Neil knows this, but, you know, where we live, uh, I don't know if any of you guys have been to the Polynesian Cultural Center or to Laie in Hawaii, but there's a long, winding road, Kamehameha Highway, and there's only two lanes going in, you know, opposite directions. It's a beautiful drive. I mean, one of the most scenic drives that you ever find in the world. And all of us who live in Laie, I mean, you know everything about that drive. You know where the curves are. You know where the straightaways are. I mean, just you drive it so many times. But I remember once we were driving. It was close by the Kualoa uh, Ranch there. And like I said, I've driven there many times. And I had the strong prompting to slow down. And, I, and it was kind of weird because I, uh, I think I was still in high school. And I hadn't had those kind of promptings before. Uh, I, I know it was an audible voice who I was driving and said, but I just had a feeling to slow down. And at first, I'm like, why? I mean, it doesn't make sense. It was a beautiful day. Things were clear. And I just didn't have why. And then I felt that prompting again, slow down. And I wasn't going super fast. I was, you know, driving the speed limit. I'm like, slow down. And again, it didn't make sense. It didn't register. But then the last one is cl very clear to me to slow down. And um, as I slowed down, there was a car coming across uh, around the corner that was passing on the curb. And now why that car was passing on the curb, I have no idea. But if I'd stayed on my same um, speed, we would have ran right into each other. And it uh, left me uh, visibly shaken because I knew what I felt. And I knew that it wasn't from my own mind because my own mind, it didn't make sense to slow down. Why well, slow down? I mean, I'm not driving fast. There's can see everything, what's the big deal? But I didn't see what was coming around the curve that somebody was passing on the wrong side of the road to pass a car, and we would have ran right into each other. So that was the first prompting as a young man. And then in 2007, um, the next uh, experience I'm going to share with you is, and I, I think this applies so much to you guys, but it's 2007, I was at the Naval Academy, I was an assistant coach there, and I was looking out of the window and we had all these helicopters outside on, the, on a, our football field. I mean, there are tons of them. And I asked somebody, what's going on? Why are all these helicopters here? And then they said, well, there's a peace summit here at, at the Naval Academy. And they had a lot of ambassadors and a lot of leaders from around the world that they were here. And obviously, nobody knew about it because it was a peace summit. And these are some things, obviously, that for security purposes, they didn't want people to know. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. They all come here to the Naval Academy, all these important people have come here to the Naval Academy. And at that exact time, I had a prompting that I was going to be the next head coach at the Naval Academy and that I needed to prepare myself. And the things that I would be teaching would have nothing to do with football, but the things that I would be teaching my players that they would go out into the world 
like these helicopters that had come from different parts of the world, and then whatever I would teach them or help guide them in the culture it would be a way that our Heavenly Father would be able to send his message throughout the world. And again, I would just think that was kind of a, when I had that prompting, I hadn't had something like that, and, and um, or as strong as that, I'm sure I had other ones, but nothing that I could recollect like that, uh, as opposed to the driving incident that I had. So I, I went back to my office and I reflected upon that. And just remembering that the last time I had something strong like that to save my life, I, I went to work. So on my own time, I started to prepare myself. I put my philosophy together, wanted to, what I wanted to do if I was to be a head coach, what we were going to do. I had everything in detail, specific details, what I was going to do if I was going to become the head coach, how we would practice, recruiting, everything. I just had everything laid on a book, and I prepared it. And when it was all done, I was like, man, that's pretty cool. But like, well, I don't know why I prepared it, but you know, at least I have something. Well, not soon, at, right after that season, um, our head coach at that time um, took, another, took another job. And I was in Seattle recruiting, and I got a, hit, a call from our athletic director. He said, Ken, uh, Coach Johnson is going to Georgia Tech. I want to talk to you about this job. Why don't you come back, get on the next plane back to Annapolis. I want to talk to you. So I got on the next plane. I was back in Annapolis. I got back to the East Coast about 6 o'clock. I went directly to the athletic director's office. But from 6 until midnight, I had a six-hour interview. And every question he asked me, I had an answer. I was prepared for everything. I think I kind of shocked him at first that, you know, because nobody knew that Coach Johnson was leaving. Nobody knew that he was taking another job. Um, and this, he called me, he knew, that, I think he kind of stunned him, like how did he have all of this material prepared on his interview? And everything, because I had no head coaching experience. I'd never been a head coach before. I'd, and when I came back and everything he'd asked me, I had a prepared answer. And I was clear on what I wanted to do. But there's no doubt in my mind, just like how the Lord had told Nephi how to build the ship, the Lord told me exactly what to do. He told me how to prepare. And when that incident came, I was ready for it. Well, in 2009, um, we were playing Notre Dame. I took my young son with me, and the way I get, people get ready for games differently. Um, some people put on their headsets, and you know, some players hit their head against the locker room. I don't know what that does, but <laughs> I, guess, I, guess, I don't know, whatever, but you, you know, get ready the way you get ready. Um, I do a lot of praying. I read the scriptures a lot. I just sit in my, so I took my son at that time, who's now going to Boise, so he was, you know, obviously that was seven years ago, so he was a little kid. And I just, you know, I was praying a lot. It's the first time he'd come to the game with me, and he just wanted to watch TV and watch cartoons and stuff. And I'd be so nervous, and I'd be reading my scriptures. I'd say, all right, son, let's have another prayer. So we'd kneel and we'd pray. Then maybe an hour or so later, you know, I'd say, okay, so we need another prayer. And, and after a while, my, you know, my son goes, man, Dad, I didn't know you just said so many prayers. I'm just trying to watch TV. I said, son, this is I'll get ready for the game. Because I know for me, I, I can't play, but I know that the Lord will guide me. I've seen him already in my life guide me that not, I did, not that I prayed to win. I just prayed, Lord, could you help me that I would know what to do? You know what I mean? I didn't think that we were better than an opponent. All I, my only prayer to the Lord, Lord, help me know what to do for my team, that I'll know what to do. Well, we, uh, it was 2009, and we were playing Notre Dame. It was on national television. There's 85,000 people, and, you know, the Notre Dame fans are pretty rabid fans, and they make a lot of noise. When you have the ball, when they don't have the, when they have the ball, they don't say a word. I mean, they're well-educated uh, fans, but they're really, really good. We hadn't beat we beat Notre Dame once in half a century, so the chances of us beating them was slim to none. Um, but early in the game, uh, there was a play that their guy fumbled the ball, and so you know we're looking at it and trying to see if we could challenge it. And I was asking my guys on the headset, "What do you think? Should I challenge it?" And everybody from the box said, "Coach, don't challenge it." It, it, it wasn't a fumble. Uh, you're going to waste your challenge. Don't challenge it. But I had that prompting again. I'm like, oh, not that again. I'm just, uh. 
And you gotta imagine, this is, when this is 80, I mean, I mean, you can't even hear yourself think. I mean, it's so loud and just people are yelling, but it was so clear again, challenge it. Because that had been my prayer the whole time. Lord, just help me know what to do. Not to win, or just help me to know what to do. And hopefully I follow it. So uh, I decided to challenge it. So I told the referee I wanted to challenge it. And everybody said, no, coach, don't do that. He goes, no, I'm going to challenge it. Well, went to, the, you know, went to the TV booth and this and that. And you know, I was watching the TV copy later. Even the commentators said, well, Coach Tomasolo wasted that challenge. That clearly was not a fumble. But then they reviewed it. It was a fumble. And, and we won the challenge. We were losing it. You know, at that point, like I said, losing was uh, probably the, the only option that was going to happen that game. We don't beat those guys. We ended up going down and scoring. And that touchdown was the difference in the game. We ended up beating them. We ended up beating Notre Dame. And I just knew it was a great, great um, guidance from the Lord. And I can share this story with you. If I had shared that with a, with a, a reporter, with things, I mean, they were like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But I can share that with you because all of us in here have had those kind of promptings and whatever it is. And just because it's in football doesn't mean it's better than, you know, helping you with your school and what you're doing. Uh, a couple other ones I'm going to share. In uh, 2014, we were playing Army. Um, again, I, I go through my same routine, how I get ready for games. I'm not the smartest coach, so I rely on the Lord a lot. I rely on the Lord a lot to help me with everything. And so we're playing Army. They're actually beating us. They're up 7-0. And they're driving again for a touchdown to go up 14-0. So things look pretty bleak for us. This is at Raven Stadium, M&T Bank uh, Stadium. Again, all these people yelling, screaming. You can't hear yourself think. It was fourth down. Uh, they broke the huddle. And I, I wish I could explain how quickly it happened. So it's fourth down. I'm standing right at the sticks. They break the huddle. As they're coming to come to the line of scrimmage, I hear that prompting again, um, call a timeout. I said, oh, no. What? And I just, again, just, but I'm, again, and just this time that they're coming, I'm trying to deduct really quickly in my mind, why? We got our defense lined up. We got the exact call that we want. They lined up. They're getting ready with the same personnel grouping that they thought that they would be in. They got the guys that we think are going to be on the right side. We got a pretty good clue where they're going to run the ball in all of our studies. But again, this is happening within seconds. These, these are thoughts going through my mind. Like, and again, I felt thinking, call a timeout. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense. Why? You know, it's just, and so right as he gets to the line of scrimmage, and right before you know, they're getting guys, the quarterback's going through his cadence, it was just like when I was driving in Hawaii, very clearly, call a timeout. Again, because those are only prayers I have before the games. Lord, just help me to know what to do with my team. Those are my prayers. Um, so I called a timeout. My, my defensive coordinator is like, who called that timeout? Who did that? Who did that? And I said, I did. He goes, oh, OK. Go over there. <laughs> but he kind of looked at me like, why did you do that? You know what I mean? Just kind of like, eh, and what was that reason for that? I didn't have a reason. I mean, I just, like, just kind of turned and walked the other way. And like, <laughs> so just commercial went on. The next play, they fumbled, and we scooped it. And then we end up going at the end of the half and tying the game 7-7. Seven to seven. So instead of it being 14-0, to zero, we tied the game 7-7. to seven to seven. We eventually ended up winning. Uh, and I shared this once in our high priest group uh, at church. And a brother whom I love said something. He kind of said something, but um, I didn't take offense to it, but I kind of set him straight a little bit. He's like, you know, I don't believe that our Heavenly Father cares who wins a football game and this and that. And I said, brother, I agree with you. I don't think he cares. But I know he cares about me and my family. And I pray for my family. And this is my job. And these are the, um, I, why is it any different than somebody that prays for the crops just always see in the scriptures? This is my family I'm taking care of. And I'm a firm believer. And nobody can tell me otherwise because those promptings that I had wasn't from anybody. And it wasn't something that I would have done on my own. Because to my mind, stopping the car didn't make any sense. In my mind, challenging it when everybody upstairs and all of my coaches upstairs, they have monitors. And they're saying, coach, don't challenge it. That didn't make sense. And calling the timeout on fourth down when we got our defense set, we got everything of our three weeks of preparation, nothing in that told us to do anything differently. But I knew where it came from. 
And the last uh, example that I'm going to share, uh, this year, you know, the brethren have come out to, with us with our Sabbath day observance. And I just thought it's, it's really left in a profound impact on me just, you know, because we know that that's um, obviously a commandment of the Lord. But the brethren have told, what's the one thing we need to do better? In this chaotic world with so many bad things going on, but there's so many great things, what the brethren want us to do, honor the Sabbath day. And I said, and that's what we need to do. How simple is that? And I thought it was really cool what Elder Nelson talked about. It'll be your sign between you and the Lord. And it really made me think again, what is my sign between me and the Lord? What is, if the Lord looks at me, what am I going to be able to say? And then I started to think about my coaching profession because I don't work on Sundays, but I'm also the boss. Um, I dictate the hours. <laughs> so if, I was thinking, wait a minute. I'm the boss. I tell when people to come to work. You know what? Nobody else is coming to work on Sundays either. So I decided, like, you know, I was like, you know, I'm going to tell guys. Before I told guys, you do whatever you want, come to work, you know, but I'm not going to be here. This year I told them, nobody's coming to work. I'm locking the offices. Go be with your family. Now I didn't force them to go to church. You do whatever you want. But nobody's going to work at a place where I'm in charge of. And I was like, Lord, I'm going to prove that we're not going to work on Sunday. Now I've never worked on Sundays. But now I was forcing our whole staff not to come in on Sundays. The most important day in our profession, when you just play your game, you're getting ready for your opponent. So our whole staff, nobody's coming into the office. And I, again, I still remember telling our staff that, and our coaching staff looked at it like, what? <laughs> we're not coming in? <laughs> what do you mean we're not coming in? And, and now nobody said that, but I could just tell by their expression on their face, like, oh, we're going we're gonna to get killed. Well, we just joined the conference. It was the toughest schedule that we've ever had. But since I want to just tell you, we had the best year in the history of our football program. They've been playing for over a century. They've been playing football more over 115 years. We had the best year ever. Not our entire staff, nobody working on Sundays in a day when everybody in my profession says that is the most important day. So. And I just want to close by saying that, that our Heavenly Father loves us. He wants to help us. And I'm a firm believer. I really don't care. Even within the church, people tell me, yeah, 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 football. Because it's not, if they look at it football, they're looking, they're not seeing the whole picture. It has nothing to do with football. It's your life, and it's what you're doing. Whatever your life is, whatever you're praying for, whatever you need help in, who to marry, what, whatever you need, our Heavenly Father is there for you. Do you think your parents would ever turn you away from anything that you needed help and guidance for? Your parents won't turn you away. Then why would our Heavenly Father that loves us more than that, a love that we can't comprehend, why would he ever turn us away in anything that we need help in? He won't, and he will help and guide us. I want to thank you for listening to my stupid stories. Um, but... There are stories I know that have touched my life, that have molded who I, have hand, who I am. Uh, like I said, I've heard s and different things when to do things. Uh, some might be one or twice. And sometimes I don't listen. Sometimes it takes a couple of counseling. It only took one counseling to marry the person back there. I, I didn't take too long. Like, that's who you need to marry. OK, I'm listening. I'm, I'm, a, I'm going to chase her. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> I didn't need three, uh, okay, what, what did you say? It was like, okay, yeah, all right, I'm, I'm going after. But um, thank you for listening to me. Thank Coach DePay for doing this. I want to thank Coach Lamb, who also, along with President Wilcox, are guided in helping you guys in building this great university. And Coach Lamb was guided um, in calling me and contacting me. And I knew that through the Holy Ghost, all of us were guided to have Coach DePay here. And really, I say that about Coast to Pay, but that's all of you sitting here. Thank you for who you are. And I'll just close by bearing my testimony that I know the church is true. I know that this is a church, and it's restored in its fullness. I know that the Savior came and was did all that was said that was done to him. He was tortured, he was crucified, and he rose on the third day. And he created this church that was restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. 
and the priesthood and all of his keys has been restored here in the latter days. And I'm so grateful for that truth. I'm so grateful for temples to be sealed to families and to know that truth that will be families forever. Thank you for who you are. Be strong in who you are. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.